Yes. Um, I'm very happy to uh, introduce Ben tonight. As you uh, see, uh, the lecture we had uh, by uh, Dominic Perrault, we had a large, a large crowd. Um, tonight we have an extra large crowd. <laughs> it's an obvious list, an obvious statement. Um, it's uh, it's useless for me to um, to introduce Ram by uh, telling you about uh, things uh, he did um, and what he's doing at, at this moment. Um, I'm very happy to uh, to have him here tonight. Uh, please, Ram, go uh, ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, who is controlling the slides? I, I want to sh show only one slide at the same time. So you have to try maybe both to see which one is the first cursor. Yeah, the, the one on the left is the first. So can you t take this one off? And, and can somebody switch off all the lights? Okay, um, I want to present tonight um, a work which is uh, not uh, only my own work, but which is uh, the result of uh, my teaching in Harvard uh, of the past year. Uh, it is uh, a project on the Pearl River Delta, a number of cities in China. And, uh, well, I cannot talk louder, but, but they maybe the... They will amplify you, don't worry. Okay. Then somebody who calls louder should shut up. Um, basically, I'm teaching in uh, Harvard uh, on condition that I don't have to teach uh, design and that I don't have to do anything with design. I'm teaching research. And uh, the first project that we have done uh, so far is a project on the Chinese city. Uh, this year we are doing a project on uh, shopping. Next year as the final uh, human activity. Next year, we will do something on the city in Africa, the condition of the city in Africa. So, basically, the subjects are not uh, sequential or they're not uh, connected, except by the fact that they're all investigations about the present condition of the city. Um, it is a project I'm doing, in this case, with six, six thesis students. Um, and so, part of the research and parts of the kind of images I'm showing are also based on their work. So I think it is fair that I name their names. Uh, it is Stephanie Smith, uh, Kate Orff, Nancy Lim, uh, Yu Yang Hong, Bernard Chu, and uh, Mikael Crown. <coughs> what is really interesting about Harvard is that, uh, and, and it is uh, true of many uh, educational establishments uh, of the moment, that the student body itself uh, is becoming increasingly diversified and that therefore you can create a kind of typecasting based on a selection of the students. And that is what we did in this case. Uh, since the subject was to study the present condition of the city in, in China, in a part of China, half of the students were Chinese or spoke Chinese, the other half didn't. Uh, since it was a kind of formerly communist uh, situation that we wanted to investigate, we had one former communist uh, uh, educated by the Romanian regime in our team. Since one of the important uh, subjects of the study is money, uh, we had the daughter of a, f a well known gold digger family from the American West as part of the team. So, in that sense, there was a kind of selection of typology uh, in the composition of the team, which in, in fact uh, sets the first. Uh, uh, step uh, on the way to research uh, and also I think it is an important assumption these days that in educational establishments it's no longer that the student comes to the school and, and there is kind of educated in a kind of more or less clever way uh, in the way things are done in that school but that since globalization every student has to be assumed to bring also a certain experience and intelligence uh, to the school. And that is uh, an hypothesis, at least, that we try to uh, work on in this case. <clears throat> the subject of the study is the Pearl River Delta, and, and which is an isolated case of a kind of more general uh, tendency which uh, we see in these uh, graphs. 
In 79, 19% of the Chinese population lived in cities, and, and these are well known, so kind of basically we are investigating something which is well known, but at the same time mysteriously unknown. Uh, in 84, it was 32%, and eight years later, it's 43%. And if you then consider that the population of China is about a billion, you can imagine what it means, uh, each of these steps, in terms of the unbelievable speed with which the urban condition has to be generated uh, in China at this moment. And the assumption was and is that uh, it is therefore plausible and probable that uh, in this speed, new urban conditions are generated uh, that kind of maybe have something to tell to us or from which we may be able to learn something or maybe not. Now, the Pearl River Delta is particularly interesting to us because it is right now a cluster of cities that are not yet forming a single city. And some of the cities are well known. There is Hong Kong, uh, so far English. There is uh, Macau, uh, still Portuguese. But then there is a series of uh, four, in fact, more Chinese cities that each have a very different uh, nature and different character. There's uh, Guangzhou, which is the old uh, provincial capital of this uh, condition, uh, formerly called Canton, and, and therefore being identified with a kind of southern Chinese style of openness and promiscuity. Uh, then there are two uh, uh, recent, relatively recent uh, cities. One is called Shenzhen and the other one is called Zhuhai, which are special economic zones, uh, which are devices or machines that the Chinese Communist government has kind of generated to uh, siphon off some of the kind of commercial energies that exist in the immediate vicinity. And, and so basically a city like this one is uh, within the Chinese system a city where rules are less stringent, where uh, money plays a kind of much bigger uh, role than, for instance, the kind of ideologic, ideologically pure situation here, and where there's a kind of explicit uh, intention to exploit uh, Westerners and to exploit its kind of proximity to uh, the thriving uh, condition of Hong Kong. So there are two of those cities, and then there is a, a fourth city called Dongguang, which uh, in a kind of interesting way uh, defines itself in terms of its difference from all the other cities. And uh, there is kind of an incredibly interesting condition of mutual exploitation in the sense that this city is there only because that city is there. This city exploits the presence of these two cities in trying to be even cheaper, even more brutal, and even more kind of radically um, um, uh, wild than uh, this one, etc. So in other words, uh, there is a kind of emergence of uh, an urban cluster. Uh, the prognosis is that in the year 2020, there will be 34 million people inhabiting this territory, which uh, is about uh, slightly bigger than the one stop. The distance between Hong Kong and Guangzhou is 120 kilometers, so you can imagine the size of the delta. So what we were seeing here was, uh, in fact, uh, a kind of future metropolis uh, emerging uh, under our very eyes in a very kind of uh, fast manner. And it was mostly our intention to uh, try to uh, understand and document uh, this phenomenon uh, as it uh, was happening. The way the project was divided is that each of the students was kind of responsible for one of the cities, but also for one of the kind of conceptual issues and chapters that we wanted to analyze. So in other words, there was one person uh, responsible for architecture, the other for ideology, uh, a third for money, a fourth for architecture, a, a fifth for landscape, etc. So each one was coupled to a subject and a city. Now, what I will do is kind of simply, so all of this was kind of triggered by uh, a 1978 edict uh, from the Chinese government, which came after uh, a lot of similar mottos that have characterized the whole history of communist uh, China, where every time from above there was a kind of uh, an, an incredible formula, an almost poetic formula, whether, whether it was let uh, thousand flowers bloom or whether it was the issue of cultural revolution 
or other kind of formulas were simply kind of imposed on the population and, and became for that period their motto or their kind of guidance. And so in 78, that guidance after Mao, uh, that guidance became to get rich is glorious, which was uh, an kind of ambiguous way of uh, uh, confessing the importance of money without abandoning the, uh, uh, the rule of the Communist uh, Party. And one of the interesting things that we were discovering as we went along on this uh, whole research was the way that kind of what is seemingly a kind of apotheosis of the market economy and what is kind of usually read as an apotheosis of the market economy can also be read as an apotheosis of the communist system of these kind of successive poetic formulas uh, being realized uh, on the spot. There's one more thing I should say about the ambition of the project. Uh, the, the ambition is, uh, and the polemic of the project is to say that um, right now the urban condition is changing faster than it ever has. Uh, that has caused a number of mutations. Uh, if you consider the present uh, vocabulary, the present ways in which uh, you can discuss cities, uh, the present framework for understanding cities, there is no way yet to interpret those uh, modifications and those mutations. In other words, our profession, I think, is se severely handicapped and, and hampered in its uh, potential uh, uh, action or its uh, potential operations by the simple fact that we have not develop, developed a repertoire of concepts or understanding that can deal with the city as it emerges. So part of what we are trying to do here is to uh, create an accelerated repertoire that uh, can follow the speed with which the city is now emerging. And so last September we introduced 75 new terms with which this kind of city can be discussed. And we first introduced it uh, in the context of the Harvard uh, body. Uh, but uh, as of next year, we will discuss it, uh, in the, uh, in, introduce it in the um, context of a book, in the form of a book, which then, where then all of these new concepts will be copyrighted, uh, so that it, uh, their ownership is made uh, clear. Uh, um, I should say one more thing about the Pearl River Delta. It is on the southern part of China. Uh, here you see the Philippines, so it's kind of the, the really uh, uh, proximity to Indonesia. So it is the really the warm, hot uh, part of the city. And this part of this underbelly of China has always used by the, been used by the regime to uh, create and to absorb forces from outside without <coughs> the consequence that they would also contaminate the main body of the country. So in other words, to a certain extent, it has always been a kind of experimental zone where this kind of reception of strange forces was uh, pursued almost under <coughs> laboratory-like conditions. <coughs> now, what I will do is I will take you kind of basically in a very short way to every city and, and on the way kind of record and, and may make a number of observations. Uh, we were not really interested in Hong Kong because in terms of our research, Hong Kong is a stable city. That is maybe kind of an unusual statement, but kind of in terms of our research, and you see here the graphs, Hong Kong has been hovering uh, the past uh, 15 years about this uh, six million, I think it is, yeah, six million mark. And as such, it is really not a city, it's of course a very dynamic city, but it, it's not kind of city that is growing uh, with a kind of speed that uh, these other cities are uh, emerging. So uh, let's forget about Hong Kong for a moment and we go to Shenzhen. Uh, uh, and, and there is always a kind of incredible flow of people going from Hong Kong uh, to Shenzhen. And look at the situation in Shenzhen. Shenzhen, the special economic zone, went in uh, about uh, 10 years from almost nothing to 800,000 uh, official inhabitants and uh, a half a million uh, unofficial inhabitants. And we will talk about that uh, more. But in other words, it's a kind of urban condition that went in 10 years from zero to a million and a half, and that has gone in the past uh, uh, five additional years from zero to three million. 
So it is kind of really when we are kind of dealing with leaps like that, that uh, the certainty that the urban condition is in itself modified uh, potentially beyond recognition uh, becomes an issue. Here you see Hong Kong, there you see Shenzhen, and uh, they're only they're separated by a mountain range, connected obviously by the sea, and there is a kind of number of border crossings here. And so basically, they started the city very brutally uh, on the part, on the point of the border crossing, and created there, in the first seven years, uh, an enormous, an, a, a kind of city from scratch, which has the density from, uh, of a metropolis. And this is what is one of the unusual uh, things, I don't know, kind of in history, kind of similar examples, that the leap from scratch to urban condition is made without enter any intermediary stages and that the beginning is immediately a kind of the assertion of a metropolitan scale and a metropolitan density. So what is important to realize is that nothing in this image is kind of older than 12 years. Uh, while in the past five years nothing has been added to it. So it's kind of a freeze frame of seven years of architectural production. Um, in, uh, it is kind of, of course, inevitable that uh, in such a system, uh, corruption uh, plays uh, kind of enormous role, and and so Shenzhen is one of the areas where corruption uh, plays almost the role of another form of planning, because uh, it is a uh, necessary device to uh, negotiate the contradiction between the rules and and the ambitions. Uh, what is also obvious in the city is that architecture is almost something that is pursued with religious fervor and that the papers, for instance, uh, occupy uh, two-thirds of their uh, complete contents about the city itself. And so it's a kind of tautological uh, condition where each page of the paper kind of reinforces the, the incredible nature of the city, uh, the incredible, uh, imp sorry, the, Im the importance of the building, of course, but also the importance of the kind of uh, infrastructure. Uh, there is endless publicity about kind of selling uh, buildings, and there is even uh, a very original way of appreciating architecture. There is, uh, like the stock market, a daily list of values of the different uh, apartment uh, buildings, uh, towers, that is kind of changing uh, every time, and which was for us uh, kind of first uh, indication that actually the value of these uh, buildings is only very partially connected with uh, the potential to inhabit them or with the need to inhabit them, but that they were kind of simply forms of investments kind of to, to be treated uh, with the same, kind of, let's say, loyalty as stocks are, are treated in the stocks market. Um, there is uh, uh, in the paper also the emergence of a kind of language, uh, kind of art about uh, Shenzhen. There was a, a daily poetry page where sometimes kind of extremely baroque and expressionistic uh, 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 poems about the qualities of uh, Shenzhen were uh, discussed. And of course, uh, as we looked around, we began to look, to, to begin to see some of the, let's say, the, the secret or the kind of unofficial sides of Shenzhen, because the official side is this kind of new metropolis which is being b b made. Uh, and the official side is a number of inhabitants uh, of maybe a million and a half. But the unofficial side is, of course, everyone who is in, in Shenzhen to build that other metropolis, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, a number of what the Chinese call floating uh, populations. And those floating populations, of course, have to live in accommodation, and this is their accommodation. In itself, also extremely interesting because uh, what, what existed here originally is a was a series of independent apartment blocks that were uh, of unbelievable density, but in the past three years of their existence, all the gaps between them have been closed uh, and are now inhabited. Uh, and, and, and basically, uh, in, so in this case, only one level, but in some cases, two or three levels of illegal uh, accommodation is added to them. So. Uh, the, the, the sheer uh, intensity of, of use and, and occupation of these uh, buildings stands in kind of amazing contrast with the kind of largely empty 
uh, status of some of the other uh, architectures, which are kind of mostly the architectures that are there for investment. So one of the first things here to see is that at the threshold of the 21st century, there is this uh, production of an almost solid building, and which over uh, uh, in the next uh, five years will become a solid to accommodate the so-called temporary or floating accommodation, which again in 90 was almost a million, and which is now reached the point of equality. And that alone, of course, presents uh, amazing conditions. So here, for instance, in this gap, would also live uh, entire crews, construction crews, uh, etc. And, and each of these buildings was in a kind of permanent process of uh, expansion and extraction. There are Chinese architects, uh, and uh, uh, I think there you can make uh, a claim that Chinese architects are the most important architects uh, uh, of the in the world. Certainly, uh, all if you look at the numbers. Uh, this was a building which was uh, designed uh, by two Chinese architects in two days. Uh, uh, on a, uh, it's funny that everyone laughs uh, uh, when I say this. Uh, I think there's nothing funny about it. And, and, and actually, uh, I would like to make it slightly sinister uh, by announcing that there will be a time that uh, you, and you, and you, and you, will be also asked to uh, design buildings in two days. And, 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 and then you're among the lucky ones. <laughs> but, but we can talk about that later. Uh, I was saying that the Chinese architect uh, is the most important one kind of in, in the world, not only because, uh, and, and their speed is uh, it's really a kind of statistical issue, because what we indicated here is the number of architects per nation. And so uh, in, in Spain, there's a very good kind of relationship. I think it's one uh, to 3,000 or something. And, and then kind of uh, France, England, uh, USA. And then USA is already slightly blessed with architects, less blessed with architects than, than uh, Europe. But then you see a kind of amazing leap, uh, which is the Chinese uh, condition. So you see that uh, basically structurally, there are 10 times as few architects in China per uh, thousand people as there are uh, in uh, any other part of the world and therefore it is uh, clear that the Chinese architect has to be ten times as efficient as any one of his colleagues. And, 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 and then uh, you, here you see uh, the, uh, the kind of the, um, so the, the, that is this and then we, if you look at the average uh, amount of building that the architect has to do then the, uh, the uh, average Chinese architect has to build, uh, construct a 30-story uh, tower every year. And that is only the average. So, so there, again, there is an enormous efficiency. Uh, and then if you look at the honorariums of the Chinese architect, then you see that the Chinese architect uh, earns a tenth of the nearest uh, competition. So in other words, there are 10 times as few. They have to build 10 times as much for a tenth of the honorarium. So if you multiply all of those, then there is a kind of factor difference of a thousand, uh, which kind of really gives the theoretical envelope of the Chinese architect and, uh, 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 and, and of Chinese architecture. And what is ironic, of course, is that this, which is a kind of average uh, collection of buildings in Shenzhen, which uh, could be e equally easily an average uh, collection of buildings in Rotterdam. Uh, and and the, it also means that, of course, the Chinese architect has found uh, a number of extremely efficient ways of uh, differentiating uh, uh, buildings. And uh, that maybe the, the most efficient one uh, is one that we are stuck with here too, which is the endless uh, manipulation of the curtain wall uh, in China, sometimes pronounced, pronounced as curtain war. <laughs> uh, and that uh, uh, became one of our uh, uh, copyrighted words for uh, the, this uh, condition of uh, uh, architecture. Here's some kind of episodes of the curtain war. Now, another one. Over oh, here. Now, curtain war, yeah. Okay, so it's clear. Now here we have a building, and, and that um, and, and and here the the kind of perversity of this system becomes uh, in a way more interesting. 
because um, not only is there an incredible speed of design and, and, and construction, but also uh, almost uh, each building uh, that is constructed uh, is uh, changing its program before the construction is final. In other words, and cha changing it, and, and sometimes these changes are kind of incredibly radical. Like for instance, an office building becomes a hospital kind of uh, halfway during the construction or some kind of other conversions uh, are possible. And, or any conversion is possible. And so here we see a building that was kind of designed as a parking garage that in the meantime uh, has, uh, is now accommodating, partly because of its uh, cheapness, uh, at least 36 other different functions. And uh, in a kind of very efficient way, each function is designated on the facade by a different fragment of curtain wall, uh, uh, so that at least there is some kind of analogy uh, between uh, what is happening uh, inside and outside. And so what is beautiful about this system is that uh, uh, Chinese architecture is never final, but is in a process of permanent conversion. Uh, there is no ultimate condition anymore, it is always mu uh, mutating from one condition to another condition. Uh, that I would like to suggest to my uh, beloved kind of European colleagues is also going to happen here very soon. Uh, and our illusion that uh, architecture will ever uh, reach any finality will probably in the next uh, 20 years uh, also evaporate here. So in that sense, uh, there is a kind of mysterious or, or almost sinister quality of premonition and prognosis uh, going on here. Um, these are just some images of kind of recently converted uh, office building that could be a bowling alley, a kind of little pond, shopping, uh, karaoke, uh, brothel uh, uh, condition. Uh, in that sense, there is almost a kind of much more seamless connection between the different programmatic uh, chromosomes than we uh, are ever willing to admit here. Now, all of this is kind of leading to a condition that we see here, where nothing in this image is older than 10 years. This entire section of the city has been generated in the past uh, 10 years, and the entire uh, system of Pearl River Delta generates 500,000 square kilometers of city per year. And that is a kind of area as big as the, the entire so-called green heart. So the, the speed and the kind of intensity of production is, is kind of literally uh, overwhelming. And what you can see here, which is to me very interesting, is that it, it, the, the future city, if you uh, consider this for a moment uh, as the future city, will consist, and uh, you begin to see the, kind of the, the examples, of kind of large chunks of landscape uh, combined with, in a very brutal way, with large uh, chunks of uh, urban substance. And you also see that the urban substance has kind of polarized in, in only two topologies. There is either the skyscraper or the hovel or the, the hut and nothing in between. And I think that could also... Here you have another kind of uh, uh, potent image of the same condition on the perimeter. Here, there are still the rice fields, and there, without any intermediate uh, condition, there's the metropolis. Kind of all, both uh, uh, juxtaposed uh, in a uh, condition that uh, could be described as hor horrifying, but also as kind of uh, extremely luxurious, in the sense that uh, there is this sense of the, uh, the two conditions uh, coexisting uh, in a single system. So, Basically, this is the old Shenzhen, although it's not, not older than eight years old. We're now moving to the middle Shenzhen, uh, which is more recent, to look at the kind of further mu mutation of the city. Here is a kind of single image. And again, in this image, uh, I would uh, say that nothing is older than seven years. Now, that is kind of a really a moment where maybe it becomes uh, necessary to replace our snickering for admiration, because uh, I ask all of you to conceptually move to New York and to think of Central Park uh, and the architecture that surrounds it. Um, for that complex to emerge uh, at least, uh, you could say two centuries, but at least there were at least 150 years uh, or 100 years, let's say, between the first definition of the park 
and then the uh, reality of the contrast of a built condition facing uh, uh, virgin territory here in Shenzhen. It's happening uh, in seven years. And also, this condition is not merely a park, but it is actually highly charged because it is one of the golf courses uh, of Shenzhen. Now, golf courses are taking more and more important role in the life of uh, the, the Asian uh, metropolis and are uh, to be considered as important parcels of a new Asian uh, definition of centrality. In other words, we have a few kind of ridiculously residual golf courses that, that uh, are uh, uh, painfully embarrassed about their kind of very, very existence uh, tucked away in the armpits of some kind of infrastructure. Uh, here they are simply and grandly announced as the uh, uh, core and, and maybe the most attractive parts of the city and are actually emerging and merging with uh, other forms of accommodation so that there is also kind of seamless emerging of a seamless condition of housing, shopping, golfing uh, in uh, new forms of centrality that uh, are unimaginable here, kind of merging. Photoshop is another word that we have intended to copyright. Photoshop, the kind of the, the, the easy way in which you can make collages in, in a computer, is actually maybe the nearest analogy to the way things are produced in China. Here we have a, a view of, of the golf course. The golf course are uh, almost, I should say, of course, open 24 hours a day. Uh, uh, because the, the chi new Chinese city is open 24 hours a day and functioning and vibrating t 24 hours a day. And of course, apart from the golf course, another, uh, another uh, form of uh, kind of providing identity, uh, well, I could say again to try to repress this kind of snickering, we don't even have an Eiffel Tower. Uh, but anyway, uh, so another kind of vehicle of um, uh, the creation of centrality and identity is the pro proliferation of theme parks. And actually, the, the Eiffel Tower there was very important for our orientation in the city. But there's also an, a neighboring theme park that uh, contains uh, a series of miniature Chinese uh, monuments. So the new center of Shenzhen is just a seamless uh, composition of golf courses and theme parks. Uh, and, well, this is the plan, and, and, and of course, uh, that then becomes part of this contrast between this kind of extremely built condition and the new urban condition around it. So, consider that we've done, uh, in quotes, Shenzhen, we now move north, um, and we move uh, on the Gordon Wu Highway, which is this red line. Now, it's very unusual that uh, a highway is called after the owner, uh, but that is uh, the case here. This highway is owned by a single uh, individual, uh, an engineer uh, who is also a developer and who lives in Hong Kong, and whose obsession is uh, to, uh, to create infrastructure for the future of Asia. Um, now, he has a very skeptical kind of relationship with the Chinese which is expressed in this building, because uh, as opposed to kind of most highways, it is not built on the ground, but it is, it is for its entire 120 kilometers, built on a viaduct, on pilotis. So here you see it, kind of, it goes uh, endlessly, uh, uh, without any uh, uh, contact uh, with the uh, ground, uh, and, and after a while it becomes uh, clear why this refusal is because it does not want to be on the ground and there where it intersects with the kind of uh, actual condition of China, it wants to control the situation. Here we have a kind of view, but then here, because what the his highway also includes is a series of stops of artificial intersections on point where there is so far no visible reason to uh, get off or on the uh, highway. Uh, uh, um, there is a kind of ingenious and, and certainly Chinese design of the kind of clover leaf. But what this uh, uh, means and represents is that um, Wu 
doesn't want to have contact uh, with the Chinese ground unless he can control and create a city at the moment uh, where the highway lands. And so that is the point. The, the highway is also a project to create uh, in this uh, enormous uh, um, uh, energetic landscape uh, a number of 12 or 14 entirely new cities. So at each intersection there is a kind of plan for um, uh, a plan for the, f the, the core of the city, uh, basically built uh, underneath the highway an incredible complex ways of, of guaranteeing that this will be the future center. And so here we have a view of it, and here we have uh, a view of it completely uh, abandoned uh, situation. Now, when we saw that in Shenzhen, uh, actually some of the most glamorous of the buildings are occupied only for 15%, uh, uh, and that uh, in certain cases a 7% occupancy rate is considered uh, an enormous success. And whether we then saw this, uh, uh, the construction of uh, unlimited amount of uh, future ghost towns, uh, then it became clear that the assumption that all of this can be explained by market economy uh, is uh, completely false and that there has to be another assumption and our assumption was this assumption that kind of maybe uh, it was better and, and uh, let's say more appropriate to look at it as a kind of final apotheosis of the communist system where communism has always had uh, a uh, an, uh, um, mechanism that the tortures and the difficulties of the present were justified and explained by the sublime, sublime quality of the kind of ultimate uh, destination. Uh, and that was called in art socialist realism, where the, the future condition would be depicted in the most realistic manner uh, as an explanation and as a justification for the present toil. In the same way, uh, we've introduced uh, the concept of notion of market realism, which explains the fact that uh, this entire activity uh, is taking place without seemingly any justification uh, in terms of the classical norms of the market economy, almost as a kind of built uh, a mir mirage of Fata Morgana, a kind of built ultimate uh, condition that sooner or later will probably be uh, occupied and can used and, and thriving if this prognosis of the 34 million is true. And, and that fact, uh, and reading it in that way, of course, gave an incredible pathos and, and almost beauty to the incredible intensity with which future buildings were being announced uh, and the, the kind of importance of billboards. This is one. This, these, the landscape is literally littered with these kind of prognosing uh, billboards. Sometimes you feel that th that will be the kind of most uh, uh, physical embodiment that they will ever achieve. Uh, but for instance, here, this is a kind of typical condition. This is an announcement of a future city. The billboard is there, the excavation is made, the landscape is raised, and this kind of represents the future, the future reservation for this city, which is called uh, a holiday uh, city. Uh, and therefore it's connected to, to a lake. And, and here again, you see this amazing condition that the, the, ex the in-between is kind of being eroded at the expense of the uh, two extremes or at the, in favor of the two extremes, the low rise and the high rise is the kind of only remaining topologies. So we became more and more aware that that became, uh, I skip this. So now we go to the, th after Hong Kong and Shenzhen, to the third city, Dongguan. Dongguan was an interesting city because it, it almost considered itself as a bastard city, not really a city, not really having this status, not really an economic zone, because the special economic zone was uh, also still uh, connected to rules, still connected to an official policy. It was more a city that did not want to be even connected to the highway system, because it felt that by being disconnected, disjointed, uh, uh, separate and autonomous, it, it would have a kind of ultimate uh, freedom to uh, guide its fate. Faith. Faith. Sorry. 
Uh, so uh, you see it here. And when we came in Dongguan, uh, one of the kind of first uh, uh, impressive things was the kind of incredible quantity of abandoned factories. And then the logic became clear. Shenzhen, in the first instance, uh, was built because factories could be cheaper than factories in Hong Kong. But then Dongguan could build even cheaper factories than uh, Shenzhen, build them in unimaginable quantities. But uh, somehow these factories uh, were uh, kind of no longer uh, useful or no longer modern enough, and then they were simply abandoned. And some, so in some of these abandoned areas, kind of some of the floating people live and squat, but on the whole, the kind of entire sectors of the city are simply empty. And Dongguan had one kind of big project, which was to take down the center and to build a new center here. So it was again a project uh, discussed in terms of uh, architecture. Uh, where this kind of architecture would be raised uh, and make place for a new condition that you see emerging there that uh, again consists of like architecture as we have in Rotterdam and uh, uh, which uh, actually uh, is uh, uh, being built on an enormous scale so there again we found our kind of most amazing ghost city uh, uh, of the journey so far an entire quarter which was kind of supposed to be the future center, which was mostly uninhabited, except that one part of them was officially designated as a mistress quarter, where the accumulated mistress of Thai, Vietnamese, Indonesian, and Philippine businessmen kind of uh, filled uh, one of the super blocks. But otherwise, uh, the entire city is yet as yet uninhabit uninhabited. So here in this kind of Basset city, not only are kind of a large part of the old stock simply abandoned, but also the largest part of the new stock is uh, abandoned in uh, anticipation of future uh, conditions. Now, we come to a kind of uh, fourth city, Guangzhou, uh, which is the traditional city, more traditional city, and therefore it had a traditional planner's office, traditional uh, apparatus of urban design uh, and architecture which produced uh, drawings like this, analyses like this, which uh, seem to be barely kind of matched by the, uh, or, or lead to kind of pretty chaotic conditions uh, like this one and like this one. But uh, the only unique element there was a billboard, uh, which was uh, Deng uh, with the slogan, 100 years of no change. So, so that was the, and, and ironically, that was the kind of only uh, explicitly communist propaganda that we could uh, find in the whole Pearl River Delta. 100 years of no change. That's uh, the amazing s slogan. But I, I don't want to waste any time on, on this one. Let's move to the next uh, carousel. So now, so basically, we've, we've seen Shenzhen. Uh, we've taken the highway, we've seen Dongguan, we've seen Guangzhou, and now we move to the southern, to the western half of the Pearl River Delta. Uh, what is interesting is that um, I was already introducing the way in which each city doesn't necessarily define itself as a kind of complement or counterpart, but simply as a kind of brutal opposition, uh, in the same way to every other one, in the same way here, the west side was tending to identify itself as the opposite of the east side, where the east side was very ruined and, and overdeveloped and turned into a kind of wild, wild east, so to speak, with kind of, uh, an incredible overdose of uh, uh, speculation. The west side was going to take uh, matters more slowly and more carefully and creating kind of more uh, idyllic conditions and, and basically of this entire uh, site, the secret model, or not so secret, was uh, to become a Singapore. So you could say this is becoming an America and that was becoming a Singapore. And, and in that sense, creating an interesting opposition within Asian terms. So what does it mean to become a Singapore? Uh, here it meant, uh, uh, most of all, clearing uh, unbelievable sections of the ground in a kind of orgy of the tabula rasa, where it really seemed as if the act of clearing uh, became a kind of an act of faith, uh, almost. 
and where uh, there seemed to be like an almost sensuous pleasure in creating void spaces, uh, uh, where the tabula rasa is kind of no longer an anticipation of something else, but almost an autonomous uh, condition. Uh, and we, this is the kind of landscape that, that then kind of generates. Entire mountain ranges, uh, ranges uh, flattened. Uh, And, 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 and note the whiteness of the, the, the abstract whiteness of the plane. In some cases, when, as we were traveling, we found kind of Chinese families picnicking on the white, kind of, so not on the nature, but on the white, as if that itself was a, an important. Uh, it gives you amazing conditions like mountains in profile, uh, profiles that you uh, otherwise never see. And, and what was amazing is that the, the texts and the, the kind of justification for this is that this was going to be a garden city. And this part of the Pearl River Delta was going to be Singapore and, and kind of much uh, better than the others. So at, at some point we were wondering, of course, where all the rubble went and where all the mountains went. It kind of then became kind of aware that maybe it has, is connected to yin and yang, and that where uh, there is a kind of uh, mechanism <laughs> that, that basically the mountain is flattened, uh, the sea is filled, and the kind of ultimate uh, production is a kind of uh, in intricate uh, cycle uh, uh, that creates more land. So then, then we came in the, the other uh, <coughs> special economic zone, uh, which was called Zuhai, and which in fact was in every sense the counterpart to Shenzhen in the sense that it actually was a garden city. So you, you could begin to see it outside the city. There was a kind of really a, a treatment and, and, a, and a respect for nature. You could see it in the form of kind of screens of vegetation that were placed at uh, tactical kind of points and, and were definitely uh, elements of, of a deliberate landscaping. You could see it in the road dividers uh, and, and you could see it in an uh, enormous abundance of flower beds that were kind of organized everywhere. And so you could also see it, of course, in the plan of Shenzhen, of Zuhai, which, is, which this is, which has an enormous percentage. I think that 30% of the city has to be garden and has to be green. And basically within that there could be these kind of urban invasions that themselves also uh, were very controlled in terms of each uh, housing project having a certain percentage of green ground. So here, certainly in the same uh, urban system of the Pearl River Delta, we found the complete counterpart to uh, uh, the other city that we had already kind of analyzed. Here, Deng had also been instrumental in triggering the uh, spurt of development. Yet, uh, the Zuhai special economic zone is good. Uh, here you see a kind of competition of logos uh, are organized uh, for the inhabitants, where you see them wrestle with the twin realities of green and urban and trying to make a kind of uh, amalgam uh, out of them. Uh, here you see the growth of Zuhai, but what is uh, more interesting than the growth, which in these statistics seems spectacular, is the real growth, because actually in terms of the success, of as successful as Shenzhen is, as unsuccessful in attracting inhabitants uh, is Zuhai. And, and at some point it became clear that the whole rhetoric of the Garden City is actually almost uh, uh, um, triggered uh, and provoked by its very lack of success uh, because it, uh, its lack of economic success forces it to find another identity to be able to compete in this uh, landscape of uh, competing urban systems. And and the theme of the competition and the issue of the competition in this clear, in this case, was clearly niceness and greenness. Uh, so this is a view of the planning office of Zuhai. Uh, another view of the master plan, another kind of representation of the master plan, and what is becoming clear here. And I hope, and, and this is then the kind of real growth of Zuhai. Again, the same steepness, but the total. Uh, in the same period of uh, time, doesn't exceed 250,000. So it's a failure, 
But what was interesting and uh, provocative is how the city dealt with this failure. And uh, it is completely impossible to say that this failure will not kind of sooner or later uh, turn into a kind of raging success. Here you see some of the kind of the urban quality of the city, where this insistence on its garden quality kind of really dictates every view, uh, uh, dictates every billboard, this dictates every corner. Uh, you see kind of the, all the paraphernalia of seduction uh, are used. This was a kind of a vacation village for uh, workers. This was a vacation village for middle management. Uh, uh, and, and in that sense, uh, what, what is interesting about the whole of Pearl River Delta is that it seems as if the total number of inhabitants is too small and therefore has to inhabit the entire urban system in shifts uh, and that all uh, habitation is provisional and so that therefore maybe the most stable condition is the one of a motel, something that is occasionally occupied and, and, and always occupied by indifferent uh, succession by different uh, people. And that again might be uh, a kind of sign of a kind of future urban condition that sooner or later will also happen here. So even though it, the city was a failure, it, it was very adamant about being a success in the future. So it had a major international airport. Uh, uh, so far, there's only five flights a day. Uh, but there will also be indirect connection to the uh, airport, an aerotropolis, uh, a kind of fragment of metropolis, uh, which will have obviously excellent connections, but which will also uh, uh, be, and, and that's why I think it's too early to say, uh, since it's facing the uh, ocean, maybe very soon a very attractive uh, condition, but more about that uh, later. So what was interesting is that on the one hand, there was a kind of, that each of the cities I've d described so far has a completely different way of planning its future, plotting its future, conceiving its future, uh, and dealing with its own kind of problematics. Here, the metropolis. But this, uh, although there is no sign of any building, uh, the site, of course, is, is already completely cleared. And then, we, yeah, Zuhai is also uh, sponsoring a project by Arata Isuzaki, where just in front of the key site and, and near the airport that is here, there will be a copy of Venice built, which also may happen. But so what became kind of more and more interesting is how Zuhai, in a way, turned this failure into a quality and turned its kind of ghost status into uh, a, a specific and deliberate status, uh, from an accident into a deliberate status, by imagining everywhere in the city corridors that were so equipped that you could kind of read its future status. And just as the Russians were uh, building under the Tsar's Potemkin villages, where villages seemed to be bigger and healthier than the actual villages, for the inspection of the Tsar, we've called them Potemkin corridors, where each of these corridors kind of acquires uh, a status or a suggestion which is beyond its kind of reality. So here you see one Potemkin uh, corridor. Uh, another Potemkin corridor was the longest uh, lover's lane in the world, kind of 15 kilometers long, kind of facing uh, the sea. Uh, there's a beach Potemkin uh, corridor. Uh, where these are kind of certainly the harboringers of a kind of more emphatically tropical condition. But the most interesting Potemkin quarter was maybe this one, which was a kind of bridge that uh, went from Zuhai to Hong Kong. This is a distance of 80 kilometers, and uh, so it seemed like an extremely ambitious project for a garden city that uh, was uh, so, lo uh, so far hardly viable. We wondered why a metropolis like Hong Kong should be connected to a flower bed, but then posing the question was answering it in the context of this kind of city, because of course a metropolis has to be connected to a flower bed, and preferably by a device that leaves the metropolis the metropolis and the flower bed the flower bed. And this is an interesting way of where we are kind of used that uh, infrastructures have a kind of homogenizing and equalizing effect, and undoing the tension between poles, 
uh, what is happening there, I think, is that the infrastructure is used for maintaining and increasing the, the differential between the two sides. And as one of the kind of articulation of this, this particular Potemkin corridor was that it had very different status. Uh, this part was being built, this part was being projected, and it was still not sure where the bridge would end. <laughs> and, and, and that, uh, of course, is also unimaginable <coughs> in the European or American condition, but there it makes absolute sense because it was set, uh, obviously not clear whether Hong Kong or Shenzhen would be the dominant of these two cities. So it was very wise to wait. And if uh, Shenzhen would win, the bridge could end there. And if Hong Kong would win, uh, the bridge could uh, uh, end there. So here you see the mayor again kind of witnessing one of his Potemkin corridors. Here you see yeah, this part was being built. And, and at, at the same time, this island was acquiring status as a pigeon theme park and uh, bungalow area. And then here you see the rest of the project. Here you see the beginning of the bridge the actual pylons being constructed and, and, and of course this degree of investment, the planner of the Pigeon Island, the nature of the Pigeon Island. So it's also becoming a big resort and here the question where uh, shall we end the bridge. And that was not all, uh, Shen Zuhai was also making uh, projects to, ma to connect uh, via tunnels to a series of islands that it owned just in front of Hong Kong. So that some of these tunnels would be kind of 70 kilometers long. So that uh, uh, basically uh, this garden city would be maybe the most uh, rich in infrastructure of any urban condition in the world to kind of artificialize, uh, to, to in the most artificial way kind of exploit all its strategic advantages because of course if it would have access to these islands which it owned, it could then begin to uh, control the flow of ships both to uh, Hong Kong and Shenzhen and uh, could uh, somehow generate impediments that would be, uh, encourage people to uh, use its new harbor, which is the deepest ocean harbor uh, constructed in Asia and which is kind of assumed uh, to uh, uh, surpass Rotterdam in the year 2010, according to the planning of Shen uh, Zuhai. So, in that sense, I think that we are uh, facing a, a totally new and different kind of infra conception of infrastructure. Uh, infrastructures were mutually reinforcing and totalizing. They created a kind of a whole. They're now becoming more competitive and local. They no longer pretend to create functioning holes, but spin off functional entities, separations. Instead of network and organism, the new infrastructure rate creates enclave, isolation, and impasse. No longer the grand récit, but the parasitic swerve. And so this is one of these kind of readings where you know, the, there is kind of simply uh, a mutation in the value of a word and a kind of radical change in the uh, value of a uh, word that so far has not been kind of signaled and that needs to be signaled in order to understand what is happening in the city and to some extent in our cities. So asymmetry is then kind of renewed as a concept and that is becomes all the phenomena that restore, maintain or intensify equalities on which this urban system is based. Now, uh, you've all been kind of sufficiently skeptical about Zuhai, laughed at its ambition, but what is the kind of real uh, issue of course is that Zuhai is connected to uh, Macau Macau, you see Macau here in the distance. Uh, you see it here uh, closer. And then you can realize what it's, where its future resides. Because just as Hong Kong now is a, an extreme urban condition with freedom, Macau is an extreme uh, urban condition, uh, extremely dense with freedom. But as you also know, in 97, freedom will end in Hong Kong. And in 2000, it will end in Macau. And then, of course, Hong Kong and Macau will simply look like incredibly overcrowded, rich in slums and rich in unattractive conditions uh, cities where without the lure or the attraction of freedom, there's actually nothing to keep anyone there. And of course, at that moment, which we've called, uh, I think, transitional reversal, uh, 
at that moment, of course, Zuhai will become uh, a thousand times more attractive than Kanemakao and actually uh, be, be able to uh, compete in a very real and legitimate uh, sense. So these are all the kind of infrastructural kind of projects going on in the region. Uh, so in the, I want to end with a kind of series of the concepts that, and, and, and the notions that we think we, we have been able to isolate from all, all this evidence. And kind of maybe the, the dominant one is one that we have called, uh, and which describes this urban system, which, which we've co we called uh, cities of exacerbated difference. What it means is that if this is Hong Kong, this is Zhuhai, this is, uh, this is Shenzhen, this is uh, Guangzhou, uh, uh, sorry, Dongguang, Guangzhou, Zhuhai, and Macau, then each of these cities is kind of perpetually uh, defining itself in terms of difference from every other city. And at the same time, we know that they are destined together to form a single urban organism. And what is interesting in this kind of model of the city of exacerbated difference is that it, uh, in order to survive, it will always have to renew its differences. In other words, the moment that these blur and that the identities kind of become similar, it loses some of its kind of vitality, not only, but also some of its strategic way in which it can kind of operate in the world. Uh, and in that sense, what is interesting is that, although it seems a very brutal model, the obligation for uh, each city to uh, adjust itself to every change that is taking place in any of them makes it a kind of very unstable model where each of them will be kind of perpetually uh, forced to work on its identity and to assume different identities in relation to whatever happens in all, any of the other ones. So this is our definition of this uh, city of exacerbated uh, difference. The traditional city strives for a condition of balance, harmony, and a degree of homogeneity. City of exacerbated difference is based on the greatest possible <laughs> difference between its parts, complementary and competitive. So in a climate of permanent strategic panic, what counts in the city of exacerbated difference is opportunistic exploitation of flukes. And that was one of the interesting things, that every accident was immediately becoming a theme and uh, becoming the, the reason for kind of new ideology instead of slow methodical creation of the ideal. And then the last thing you can, can read uh, yourself. So that is one, the, the basic, the basic uh, issue. Uh, what is another issue is that kind of we have always been kind of ashamed for the diagrammatic and, and, and somehow assumed that the diagrammatic was unreal and that the diagrammatic had to be uh, enriched with uh, specificity. Uh, what is interesting here is that the diagrammatic is the kind of only rule and forms the dominant uh, rule. And uh, also we've introduced the notion of the kind of systematic disadvantage, where conditions where successive and systematic forms of neglect, natural, political, economic, culture create a reservoir of simultaneous resentment and recklessness that is harnessed for certain spurts of drastic change. Uh, the, one of the most important uh, kind of new aspects of the cities is, is kind of to do with landscape. Uh, I already kind of showed a number of kind of very dramatic insertions uh, of landscape or juxtapositions or hybrids of the urban and landscape. Um, some of them were accidents, but we've seen also on the west side uh, the um, graduation or degradation of uh, tabula rasa as landscape, or the, the reading of tabula rasa as landscape. Um, we think that uh, what we have here is an entirely new condition, which we've called the scape. Uh, and scape, we would define as neither city nor landscape. It is a new post-urban condition, which you know, can be the amalgam of golf courses, theme parks, uh, 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 housing projects, skyscrapers that, that uh, we've seen. New urban condition, it will be the arena. Huh? Uh, uh, but anyway, I think that what, what it kind of really announces is probably the end of two disciplines, uh, architecture and landscape architecture, and the kind of uh, their, uh, their future merger. Uh, I think that uh, I want to end this uh, lecture maybe with a kind of few images that are pretty eloquent 
uh, in terms of those uh, conditions. This is like a medium representation of scape, the, the kind of rice fields and the new village. Here it becomes already kind of more drastic, the, the kind of presence of the metropolis and the most uh, atavistic agricultural condition is in a single frame, which was almost present in every one of these conditions. Here it is also extremely uh, readable. There's here the rice fields in a circle, here an intersection that kind of really represents the urban condition at its most intense. The, there are no longer than, uh, no more than 800 meters uh, separate. Here is the billboard of uh, 100 years of no change. Uh, it's next to a fish pond, and, and, and it is a kind of urban texture where everything between skyscraper and, and low rise has been completely evacuated. And I think that this is in itself uh, a very strong uh, image of the future, and this one uh, kind of simply uh, represents it uh, at the bigger scale. And this is the image I would like to end the lecture with. Thank you. Is, uh, the question is, who is financing all these incredible... You didn't finish your sentence. Um, there, there are an enormous amount of the money uh, comes from Chinese uh, people living, not living in China, so in all the surrounding countries, Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, Hong Kong, Vancouver, uh, you know, wherever. That, that is kind of one, one of the... Uh, but there is also, of course, a lot of foreign money. Uh, and there is uh, certainly also an enormous amount of kind of illegal foreign money that is kind of laundered via kind of uh, very short channels between you know drug cartels, mafia, etc. So it's kind of basically, um, let's say, the counterpart, a parallel universe where you know money can be spent in unlimited uh, quantities. What was the final outcome of the studio? Seventy-five definitions. The final studio, outcome of the Harvard studio. Uh, what, what do you mean? Um, you said that it was a kind yeah, of. Yeah, so, so basically, well, what we, we, we are working now on a, on a book where, which, which is a composition of these kind of uh, seven separate studies, an overall um, interpretation, and, and the, the new repertoire of concepts, right. yeah. which we maybe spin off as a kind of separate uh, thing. Yeah, go ahead. You talked about communist market reality as something like socialist reality uh, in the past. Uh, and but besides, you said you or you architects of the future will be very happy to have two days yourself to design such large buildings in the future. But we aren't living here in communist market realities, or are we? Uh, do you want me to clarify what I meant uh, when I said uh, uh, it would happen here? Yes. Okay. Well, I think that uh, <laughs> um, my let, let's say one of my initial impulses to to do these uh, studies and uh, motivations was that um, I um, I was began to teach in Harvard and I saw that uh, there was a kind of um, procedure that kind of people came from outside and the first project uh, they would have to do was to work uh, to renovate an abandoned harbor pier in Boston Harbor <clears throat> and so I used I asked for a class you know where do you come from and it turned out that many of the Asian uh, students had had kind of impressive careers before they came to Harvard they would have kind of planned a section of the center of Singapore or whatever so actually there, there was a kind of painful uh, condescending quality to to the university that kind of that assumed that its reality and the reality of the 
kind of local uh, condition where it uh, existed was was uh, valid for the entire world. And all I'm kind of saying is that it is now the case that in large part of the world, the speed of architecture has been increased uh, beyond anything that is imaginable uh, to us, and also beyond anything that that any educational system can deliver. And that is uh, really one of the provocations that, uh, or one of the questions at least, I would like to kind of raise is if, if the fact is that people, after they leave school, have to design buildings in one week, would it not be interesting to try to teach uh, in a particular school students to design a building in, in, one, in one week without necessarily wanting to kind of open up the, the whole kind of uh, depressing uh, discussion about uh, Bozar and kind of formula, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I mean, anyway, this acceleration uh, is present in very large parts of the world, and somehow, sooner or later, through the process of globalization, the same norms will encroach and kind of threaten the situation here in a very uh, drastic and, and real way. I think that's all I'm saying. Huh? I think that um, if each of you could design a building in two days, then each of you could work here. And then each of you could uh, participate and contribute to the creation of that landscape. I mean, uh, uh, and, and I think there are kind of a number of interesting potentials there. And, and actually some of my students worked in China for over the summer. And, and actually they were all, all in China. And let's say within, um, Two months, they were kind of redesigning cities, villages, uh, etc., etc. So it's a kind of an incredible need and incredible absorption. But but it it is also dependent, of course, on the kind of way of operating, which is totally different from anything we know. Shall we stop it? Because there's a kind of uh, uh, okay. Thank you.